Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We have returned to our building. The sermon you will hear is from the date indicated. The music was pre-recorded during the months we were out of the, our building due to COVID-19. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us. May God bless you. I'm Pastor David Richardson. Last week we spent some time thinking about salvation. We learned that we are saved from sin and from the punishment for sin. We're saved from destruction or perishing. And we look forward to eternal life. A life without pain and sorrow. A life in the presence of Jesus. But what are we saved for? Eternal life will not just be forever. It will also be without sin. In other words, a holy life. God intends for believers to be already living that holy life here in this life. And that's our desire too, right? After all, we repented of our sins because we don't want to live that way anymore. We didn't just repent because it was something we had to do to get to heaven, but because, as God knows, we were genuinely contrite about our sins. We gave up a life centered on pleasing ourselves for a life centered on pleasing God. Life is not about us. It's about living for Jesus. Eternal life starts here and now. If our repentance was genuine, then we've turned away from sin and toward holy living, which is why the writers of the New Testament emphasize sanctification. Salvation is not meant to be alone. It's meant to be accompanied by sanctification. But let's be clear. Sanctification does not mean working to earn our salvation. Working to earn our salvation means that we think that we can do and be good enough to please God. We can't. Sanctification doesn't come before salvation or cause salvation Instead, sanctification accompanies salvation. Before we go any further, we need some definitions. Holy is a word we use for someone or something that is set apart for God. I'll be mentioning the word saint later in our study this morning. We often hear it used to mean an extremely good person. 
In the Bible, it's used to refer to all believers who are all expected to be holy, set apart for God. And sanctify is the action of making something holy. Sanctification refers to the process of becoming holy. Now, the first word on our list, the word holy, comes from Old English. The other three come from Old French and from Latin before that. But I found it interesting that the Greek words all come from one root word, at least in the verses that we'll be studying this morning. Romans 6.19 Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. The word members refers to parts of the body. Paul was contrasting their way of life before they became followers of Jesus with their life after they became followers of Jesus. Once, meaning before they were believers, they presented their members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness. In other words, they gave their bodies over to moral uncleanness and disobedience. That was their lives in the past. And now Paul expected them to present their members as slaves to righteousness. In other words, it was no longer moral uncleanness and disobedience to God that would characterize their lives. Rather, from now on, their lives would be characterized by doing what was right. And that would lead to sanctification. It's a process. Hebrews 10.10 We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is described in this verse in the past tense. As believers, we have been sanctified. We've already been set apart for God, for holiness. And yet, as we saw in the previous verse, sanctification is a process. As we continue our walk with God, there are things that we have repented of and then gone back to, maybe more than once. So we need to become holy again and again. Notice that sanctification, just like justification, starts at the cross. Just as we were and are incapable of making ourselves right before the court of heaven, in the same way we're incapable of living holy lives apart from Jesus Christ. His death on the cross made both justification and sanctification possible. Colossians 1.22 He has now reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Here Paul tells us the purpose of our reconciliation, the purpose of our salvation. When Christ died, we were saved so that we could be presented holy and blameless and above reproach before God. The purpose of our salvation was not just to give us a ticket to heaven. The purpose of our salvation was so that we could be holy and blameless and above reproach. In other words, set apart for God. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. In this verse, Paul was speaking about the church, the people who follow Jesus. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church that he might sanctify her. That's God's purpose for the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. In the last chapter of 2 Peter, we saw that God was not willing 
that any should perish. That his will for the world was that everyone should repent and be saved. Here the will of God is our sanctification. Those who repent from sin turn toward holiness. So the will of God is that all should repent and also that those who repent would become sanctified or holy. Now we know that sexual immorality is not the only sin, but we saw that it was a serious concern for Peter in his letters, and here Paul also makes a point of it. Sexual sin is an example of the opposite of sanctification. Examples include relationships with those who are not our own spouses, premarital sexual relations, and same-sex relationships. Paul tells us to abstain from sexual immorality. Hebrews 12.10 He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. At times, along the way, we've been disciplined by God. Discipline can be painful, But the word here does not mean punishment. When we were children, the purpose of discipline was to shape our behavior and our character. But God disciplines us at a deeper level. He disciplines us so that we may share in his holiness. What could that discipline be? We've all had to go through hard things in our lives, in our relationships, in our health, in our employment, etc. And even when these crises seem rather random to us, we can learn to trust the Lord in them and through them. And then there are other events and situations where we can see the hand of God, either at the time or afterwards. We see that he was using that event or situation to shape us or mold us into the people that we should be. We see that he was doing what he knew we needed to help us to become holy people. When we were disciplined as children, we sometimes felt sorry for ourselves. But if we accepted that discipline, then we were a step closer to becoming the person that our parents hoped that we would be. Let's accept the discipline of our perfect Heavenly Father and allow Him to shape us into the people that He wants us to be. Holy people. Since all these things, I'm sorry, this is 2 Peter 3.11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? A few weeks ago, we studied this verse. It gives another reason why we should be holy. Our world is ending. Now, this has always been true at an individual level. Our bodies are gradually wearing out, and we know that one day we will go from this life to the next. Or it may happen sooner than that. Some of us have become more acutely aware in this time of COVID that anyone's life may be suddenly cut short. Or it could be a car accident or some other sudden disaster. But Peter was referring to the fact that our lives may be interrupted by the second coming of Jesus Christ, by God's judgment on this earth. That suddenly everything that we have here, everything that we've worked for, will be gone. We should be spending our time and effort on getting ready for his coming by living holy and godly lives. Paul gives a more positive perspective on the same event. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God, before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Jesus is coming with all his saints. That will be a joyful reunion among those who love Jesus. But those of us who anticipate that reunion want to be blameless. We want to be holy, set apart for God. 
Imagine the queen were to visit with her entire entourage. Would we want to be wearing ragged clothing? Would we want grease or dirt on our clothing? Wouldn't we want to be wearing our best and cleanest attire? In a similar way, at the coming of Jesus with all his saints, we will want to be ready. We will want to be holy. We will want to be sanctified. Romans 6.22 But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. In this verse, Paul talks about how we've been set free from sin. In other words, sin does not have power over us anymore. As those who are redeemed, we're no longer slaves under the power of sin. And the fruit, as he describes it, of that kind of life, living free from sin, is sanctification. We've been freed from sin in order to become holy, in order to become sanctified. And then he describes the end of sanctification as eternal life. But isn't the end of salvation eternal life? Perhaps this is a matter of perspective. We could think of the Christian life as a train. Salvation is the engine, and sanctification follows behind. Or we could say that salvation and sanctification are like strands of a rope twisted together. Reading through the Gospels and the letters, it's very clear. Jesus and the Apostles make it very clear. You cannot have one without the other. Faith is accompanied by works. Salvation is accompanied by holiness. Sometimes the Bible uses marriage to illustrate the relationship between us and God. So let me ask, what would we think of a marriage that was only promises made, where the couple didn't actually live together, didn't see each other, didn't even talk with each other? Wouldn't we question whether that was really a marriage? Getting married is not meant to be an item on a checklist, but the beginning of a relationship with a spouse. Getting saved is not meant to be an item on a bucket list, but the beginning of a relationship with God. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. In the letter to the Hebrews, this is said even more strongly. Just in case that anyone thought that holiness was an option, it's not. Holiness is essential. This means they will not see the Lord as friend and brother. Everyone will see him as judge. In fact, chapter 12 ends with the warning that our God is a consuming fire. There will be no escape for the unholy. The writer to the Hebrews makes it very clear. We're to strive for holiness. I use the word strive for a reason. Our holiness is imperfect even at the best of times. Sanctification is a process. Becoming holy is a process. But God knows the difference between the believer who is striving with God's help to be holy and slips up and the person who thinks that holiness is optional, who ignores all the verses about holiness, who thinks that having once prayed prayed a prayer for salvation, that he or she has done all that's required. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. One of the active things that we can do is separate ourselves from that which is unclean. Now, there are some of us who are called of God to minister in situations that would tempt many or even most of us to sin. 
And we pray for them that God would keep them safe. But for most of us, it's better to walk away from a situation where we know there will be a temptation to conduct ourselves in an unholy way. Many years ago, Diane and I attended a social event at another church. We were shocked when the organizers deliberately separated couples to work alongside other people's spouses for an activity. The church should not have been encouraging such things. In our society, there are already many opportunities for people to build relationships outside of their marriages. And what about the way that we immerse our minds, our thoughts, our emotions in the situations that we find on TV or on video or on the internet? We have to be selective if we're to avoid that which is unclean. We want to find a welcome in God's presence. We want him to be a father to us and ourselves to be his children. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 Let's cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Paul went on to urge the believers at Corinth to cleanse themselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Defilement of body speaks to those things that we do outwardly, our actions and our words. Defilement of spirit speaks to that which goes on inwardly, our thoughts and our attitudes. What did he mean by cleansing ourselves? It means that this is not the time to fold our hands and expect God to do everything for us. This is the time to change the channel on TV. It's the time to get off that website. This is the time to put down that book. This is the time to say goodbye to those friends and then to get on our knees and ask God's forgiveness. Yes, we will need God's help to keep away from those things. And we will pray for that help too. But we're expected to take steps to cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Notice that the purpose is to bring holiness to completion. Becoming holy is the process. Being holy is the goal. When I was a boy, I had a deep respect for my father. And though I feared his discipline, I wasn't really afraid of him. But I didn't want to disappoint him. And I may be wrong, but I think the fear of God is something like that. 2 Timothy 2.21 Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul was thinking about Timothy as one in ministry for God. He compared him to a vessel, a clay pot or a container. In those days, some pots in the house were used for unclean purposes, but other pots or containers were used for cooking or for holding clean water. And no person in their right mind would confuse the two. Paul wanted Timothy to be used of God for some honorable purpose. And for that reason, he had to be holy. The one who is holy is ready for every good work. Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The picture Paul used is taken from the Old Testament, when a lamb on the altar would be slaughtered as part of the worship of God. But there's a difference. He described the believers as living sacrifices. Their lives would consist of dying. They would be dying to sin. They would be dying to self. According to Paul, that living sacrifice would be holy. It would set them apart for God. It would be acceptable or pleasing to God. 
and it would be their worship. We don't typically think of worship that way. We sing songs, we pray, we meditate on his word, we give money. But we don't usually think of worship as giving our bodies as living sacrifices. And yet that's how Paul described it here. The other things are important too. They're part of our worship. But when we give ourselves as living sacrifices, we're giving ourselves completely. We tend to think of Mary and Joseph as saints, as very holy people. And I'm sure they would never have been chosen to be Jesus' parents if they'd not been living holy lives already. But every time Paul used the word saints in the book of Romans, he was writing about ordinary believers. And in this verse, he was writing to ordinary believers. Yes, Mary was called upon to give herself as a living sacrifice to God. And when I was younger, this verse from Romans was often used to encourage young people to give themselves for Christian ministry, as missionaries, for example. But this expectation that we offer ourselves as living sacrifices is meant for all believers. It's not just meant for saints like Mary and Joseph, or for those who are in, our, in Christian ministry in our day. This expectation is meant for saints like us, ordinary believers. This expectation is meant for all. We're expected to give ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is our spiritual worship. Since this is what God expects of us, let's make this our plan and our goal. Let us pray. Father, help us to set ourselves apart for you, we pray. We desire to please you. We offer ourselves to you. May our lives reflect your holiness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.